Love WordPress news, but hate reading? My name is Doc, and this is Doc Pop's News Drop. Uh, each week we talk about uh, WordPress news, uh, and the biggest news, uh, it seems, of the year is the coming of Gutenberg, uh, which in 4.9.8 officially has a Try Gutenberg button added to um, the dashboard for all WordPress users. Uh, so uh, that's causing a lot of interesting discussion online. Uh, this week we have Morton Rand Hendrickson uh, joining us. Uh, Morton, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Can, can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? I'm a web developer. I've been working with the web since, I don't know, 1997 or something like that. Uh, and uh, I got into WordPress right at the beginning. I think I built my work first WordPress site in 2006. Um, and now I work for LinkedIn Learning, which used to be lynda.com, uh, training people on WordPress and front-end web development and everything like that. And I'm also active in the WordPress community mostly in the um, speaking loudly about how I think WordPress should be department, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a, a popular uh, place to be, I think. Um, I, I'm actually really excited to hear about uh, your thoughts uh, about Gutenberg. Can you first off tell us what is Gutenberg and, and what does it mean for WordPress? Gutenberg is an evolution of how we manage content that we publish online. So if you think about how uh, we, we've been processing content in a web page or a web view up until this point, what we're looking at is basically a large HTML document with a bunch of different elements inside it. So you have paragraphs and headings and images and block quotes and everything else. And inside WordPress and inside most uh, content management systems, what you do is you basically type out a bunch of content and then you may highlight some of that content and click some buttons on a, on a, a, a little toolbar and that changes the functionality of some of that content. So you would type out some content and say, this is actually a quote. So I'm gonna click on the block quote button and it changes its styling a little bit. Or you add an image and then you say, I wanna align it left or right or center. So you click on an alignment button and then those things align. What Gutenberg does is say, each of these elements is actually a standalone element that has its own properties and its own functionalities. And we're gonna give you the tooling to extend that further. So when you write content inside Gutenberg, which is the next version of the editor that will come out in, with WordPress 5.0 at some point in the fall or spring next year, or at some point in the future, um, every single piece of content you put in has its own properties and its own values and is treated as, as its own element. So that means if you write a paragraph, you can click on the paragraph and you can change the alignment of it, you can change the background color or the font color of it, you can change the font size, you can give it a drop cap, uh, or you can move it inside the content, jumping it up and down between other blocks. So what, we're, what Gutenberg does is change the idea of how we publish from, we're publishing a big blob of content to we're publishing a series of blocks that have their own properties. And this changes the way uh, we interact with the content we publish with WordPress. And it also opens the door to a lot of new functionality that we previously didn't have because you can assign uh, functionality to individual blocks, and you can extend that functionality with plugins and themes. So it changes pretty much everything about how we publish content online. So, so right now, Gutenberg is really focused on the post editor, which is like mm -hmm. if you're writing a blog post, that's that's what you're going to see. Uh, but you you say it's going to take over the whole view for yeah. WordPress. What what do you mean by that? <laughs> the um. It, the history of Gutenberg is interesting because when we look at it now, like the majority of WordPress users, they will encounter Gutenberg for the first time when WordPress 5.0 comes out. So they've seen that alert thing that's on WordPress admin right now, but they probably didn't do anything about it. They just closed it. Or more likely, they are working in a website where they never see that because they're not the admin. Um, so the first time people are going to see Gutenberg will be with 5.0, which will be released sometime in the future. And they'll be like, Whoa, <laughs> this is a complete change of everything. Where did this come from? Well, if we go back in time, the first time the idea of content blocks in WordPress was proposed was in 2013. That in my calculation is like, what, five years ago now? 
so this is an idea that's been brewing for a very long time. And the idea was always for it to be a way for us to define content within the content editor that could then be moved elsewhere within the view. Because if you think about how a website works now, if you build it with WordPress, you're basically writing a post or a page. And then around the post or page, you will have a header and maybe a sidebar and a footer and some other content, right? So you basically write a post or a page and that slots into this display that has all these other pieces that are provided by the template. That's not how web development outside of WordPress works anymore. More likely, you people who develop websites outside of WordPress, they work with modules. So they say, like, in this view, so the about view, you would have these pieces of content aligned in this order, and this is the kind of stuff that goes on it. But in this other view, you would have completely different things. And we kind of have that in WordPress in that when you go to an index view, so like the front page or an archive, you get a different kind of template than if you go to a post or a page. So what Gutenberg has the potential of doing, it's not doing it right now, but it could, is allow us to start thinking about everything that we put inside WordPress as a block, and then allow themes to um, be collections of blocks instead of being this predefined template thing. So when you develop a website, you would say, I'm gonna write out these four blocks, and then like this block's gonna have an image, and this is gonna be the logo block, and the header block, and the sidebar block, and this other thing. And then you would nest the blocks inside one another in the view you want to deliver so that you can create these highly customized experiences. That's the promise of Gutenberg, and that's always what the idea was. It just started in the editor. Now, whether or not we get there is up for debate because of a lot of different pieces and a lot of complications around it. But that's the hopefully where we end up going. Yeah, you you mentioned debate uh, and um, there is a lot of uh, uh, older WordPress uh, devs, I guess, that are hesitant to switch to Gutenberg. I think I think most um, new WordPressers, uh, especially anybody coming on after 5.0, won't even care or they'll love the experience. Uh, but obviously there's a, a, a lot of people who are worried about sites breaking or just don't want change. So there's the official classic editor plugin that the WordPress core team released. Uh, and this is something that's going to block Gutenberg functionality. It's meant to be sort of as a temporary stopgap, even though they've had a year and a half to kind of plan for it. This is something to kind of prolong that another maybe year and year and a half. Um, but you you say that you feel that that this is actually bad for WordPress in general. And I, I believe you were saying that uh, critical mass is necessary. Like we just need to use Gutenberg. We can't have these plugins uh, that still have the ability to block Gutenberg because that it's already been, I guess, four years or five years in the making. Um, you say it's time that we just fully embrace it. Can you can you tell us about that? I have very strong opinions about how Gutenberg is being rolled out, and I truly feel that uh, there there are some missed opportunities. Uh, around this. And this is not a critique of the Gutenberg team or what Gutenberg can do. It's more a reflection on a lot of some of the principles that we've built around how WordPress itself works. So if you roll it back a little bit, my argument, which I presented in uh, at WordCamp US last year, so in 2017, was that 5.0 should actually be a clean break from WordPress tradition to say that we're not just going to roll out Gutenberg. We should actually like rethink everything because a lot of the legacy we have in WordPress is becoming more and more of a problem. Like WordPress is backwards compatible to very, very far back, not all the way to the first version, but it's really com backwards compatible to a long, in, in a long chain. And that has been the power of WordPress, but it's now like pulling a grand piano behind a car because we have to, Every time you add a new functionality to WordPress, you also have to go in and make sure that that functionality does not conflict with something that happened in a previous version, right? Which is, it doesn't make any sense today. It made sense three years ago. It actually doesn't make any sense today because um, making the backwards compatibility ends up taking so much, so many resources away from development of new features. So what normal 
software and hardware companies do is they draw lines and they say, here's the, the line in the sand here. So if you're on, like if you own an iPad 2, you can't update to the latest version of the iOS uh, so, uh, um, operating system. It just does not exist for you. It is not there. You try, it just says, no, the end. You can get up to this version, the end. It stops here. And that's because at that point, Apple realized the we need better hardware or different hardware or whatever, and we're not going to let our software be punished by older devices, right? We have to start thinking like that about WordPress, that we can't rely on code that was written 10 years ago, still working today, because it prevents us from evol evolving into the future. Now, that path was not taken. That's unfortunate because it's gonna, it has to happen at some point, but there's not enough support of this kind of thinking in the upper echelons of the decision-making system for that to happen. So what we've ended up with instead is Gutenberg as it is now, which is um, build on top of WordPress that extends WordPress almost like a plugin. In a very real sense, a plugin right now, but even when it's in core, it'll continue to be an extension on WordPress functionality for good and bad. The problem is right now, all Gutenberg does is replace the editor. And that's something that we can do in a functional way. And that is something we can also allow people to disable in a functional way. And that's what this classic editor plugin does. It says, oh, I see you have WordPress 5.0. I'm gonna just give you the classic editor instead. And just ignore all this block stuff. Don't get any of the features roll WordPress as if it was the same thing, which works fine as long as WordPress, as long as Gutenberg stays inside the editor. The second Gutenberg moves beyond the editor, so into the customizer, which is ostensibly the next step or anywhere else, the classic editor plugin simply will not be enough. So then you either have to have another plugin to fix other things that Gutenberg does, or you need to re-engineer the classic editor plugin to turn off more features into WordPress. And you very quickly end up with a situation where people won't be able to, um, like the development of WordPress will be extremely complex because you have to account for these different types of users. And at the same time, you'll end up with a situation where people won't be able to take advantage of the features in WordPress and they won't even know why things aren't working the way they expect. <laughs> So ideally, what we would see, in my opinion, is uh, people migrating to um, 5.0 when they can. And this when they can part is really important because you and me and people who are inside the WordPress community, we know about Gutenberg. We've known about Gutenberg for years. We're just waiting for it to happen. And we're like, why is it not happening sooner? The rest of the world has no idea what this is. Some of the users that use WordPress have seen that alert that says you should try Gutenberg now. The majority of them have disabled it or turned it off. As we can see by the install numbers, we have like, what, 250,000 installs out of 30 million websites. That's what, less than 0.01%. So the reality is this will come at people from out of nowhere when WordPress 5.0 releases. And for all the Gutenberg team has done to remediate any issues, there will be giant issues for a lot of complex sites. Like I have built sites in the past that I know will not work properly with Gutenberg. Um, and those clients, I've gone to some of them and I've said, hey, I don't actually do any client work anymore, but I can give you someone who can fix this for you. And they're like, why am I supposed to spend money on this now? I already spent a ton of money on building this website. Why is this being imposed on me? And then I can go into this whole thing about, you know, a website is a living thing and you have to invest money in it and you, you know, these things happen and it's no different from your car or anything else. This is how the world works. But the reality is in all other circumstances, people can choose to offload themselves from that development plan and say, I'm gonna put, push the pause button. The classic editor plugin is the patch that we are currently offering people. It is not a good patch because it doesn't solve for the problem of Gutenberg continuing to evolve. And uh, if you've been on Twitter today, <laughs> I posted a thing yesterday. I posted a patch uh, for WordPress or a, a, a ticket on WordPress track. And I posted a huge article about why I think we should have a an official long-term support version of WordPress for 4.9 point, whatever we end up with when 5.0 comes out in place of the classic editor plugin. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions on it. Um, 
I personally think my stance that an LTS version is better than the classic editor plugin comes from a different place than a lot of the people that support the classic editor plugin. Because I'm not thinking about how to best make this work for Gutenberg. I'm thinking about how to best make this work for the people who run sites that cannot update to Gutenberg now and won't be able to for years because of different issues. And the classic editor plugin will become another giant giant piano that we're tracking behind WordPress unless we offload these people onto like a sidetrack that does not move. Uh, so to answer your very simple question, very simply, if you can, you should update to Gutenberg now before 5.0 comes out. You should go into your WordPress install and install the Gutenberg plugin and just adopt that platform. However, there is a chance that you can't in that case, you need to make your voice heard in the conversation and make sure people understand why you can't. Because a lot of the conversation that's happening around Gutenberg right now is if people aren't updating to Gutenberg, it's because they're effectively Luddites, right? Or because they're resisting or because they're old or because whatever. But in, in the real world, the real, in like outside of the WordPress bubble, the reality is the people who can't update to Gutenberg are universities with 30,000 users. They are large enterprise installations that have invested millions of dollars in their website already and have entire customized setups for uh, content management and uh, editorial processes and everything. And changing to Gutenberg would mean retraining every single staffer and re-engineering the entire system. Right. And the, the thing is, you could say, well, those people have had two years to plan. No, they haven't because Gutenberg is not finished. It's not ready. They are still changing core parts of Gutenberg. So you can't responsibly update your installation until Gutenberg is actually ready. That's why LinkedIn Learning, which I work for, does not have a course on Gutenberg development yet because I can't justifiably make a course on Gutenberg development where when the pieces of code I would put into the course change on a weekly basis. Right. So we're not the WordPress community is not ready to update to Gutenberg. We pretend we are, but we're not until Gutenberg is ready. No one can prepare for Gutenberg. And right now there is no runway. It's literally Gutenberg is ready. We're shipping today. Right. I proposed uh, in December last year that there should be like a six month moratorium on changes in Gutenberg from it's ready till it gets released. So people actually have time to prepare so that everything is ready. But that's not happening because it's open source and people like to pu push the publish button as quickly as possible. So in lieu of that, we need a long-term support option where people can simply push the pause button and say, I'm not going into the future just yet. I need time. I need to allocate funds. I need to allocate time to actually do this properly. Well, you mentioned uh, that obviously this is open source and uh, WordPress uh, actually started off as a fork of Cafe Blog. Uh, so what I'm hearing now is a small group of people suggesting a hard fork uh, at 4.9. Uh, so there will be WordPress, which will evolve into Gutenberg, and there will be Classic Press, uh, which will stay, I guess, basically 4.9, and uh, I mean, continue to be maintained, but not not adopt the Gutenberg model. Mm -hmm. uh, is this sort of, I mean, do you see this fork as being the solution? No. Or does that make things worse? It makes things worse. I understand why it exists. I predicted it would exist. I actually wrote an article about this in December, 2017, where I explicitly said, unless this is handled properly, there will be a fork and this fork will damage the community. And you know, the fork is now being built and there is, absolutely nothing wrong with building a fork of WordPress. I 100% support it. I will put, I will actually put money into that fork if it ever exists. That's not the point. My concern with the fork is that this fork was forced on the community by an unwillingness to accept that there are people who need to stay with the older version of WordPress. And it creates the situation where um, an unnecessary rift occurs inside the community. Because if we have an offload point, like an LTS um, where we say, hey, are you? if you're not ready to up upgrade to Gutenberg in 5.0, you can just stop right here. We'll give you security updates and nothing else. 
and you can pause until you're ready. That would be clean because it would happen inside WordPress. The second we have this other fork that sits on the side, that fork has every incentive to actively go to the user base and say, hey, that Gutenberg thing is going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. You should not do it. You should, in fact, step away from WordPress and go over to our fork instead. And, and the people behind Classic Press, the fork, published an article today is saying exactly that and running the numbers and saying, you know, Gutenberg is going to cost a ton of money and time, and this is why you shouldn't have it. Now, the thing is, I believe, and I haven't talked to them, but I'm, I have a strong suspicion that what the people behind the Classic Press fork want is exactly what I'm talking about, the LTS version of WordPress, so that we give people the opportunity to not have to leave the platform entirely, but just push the pause button. And there is this built-in, very odd reluctance to do this. And I say odd because WordPress already ships long-term support versions for every single version after 3.7. So this is not a new thing. The only difference between how we have done things up until this point and what I'm proposing is simply make it obvious to people. Say, you can update to 5.0 or you can go on this long-term uh, support thing, but the long-term support thing will not get any updates other than security updates, and those updates will terminate at this particular time, moment in time. And then we can even run a counter and tell like, you only have one year left of support, you need to update now and clearly communicate to people what's happening. Without that, we get this fork and we'll get other forks that will become malignant, like they'll actively try to fight what WordPress is doing. And there will be this tension building up between them where you'll uh, get this animosity and you'll get language that sounds like a fight. And all this is unnecessary. Like this is this is causing an unnecessary rift in the community where people who want the same thing end up having to part ways and end up having to fight each other just because a rational decision was not made. And a lot of this just come, goes back to this classic editor plugin, which honestly was a bad idea from the start because it was originally... I don't know if anyone remembers this. It was originally the gluten-free or was a Glutenberg-free plugin, which was a joke. It was like, some people are going to hate Gutenberg. We're just going to make a stupid plugin that disables it. And then someone was like, well, we should actually make this official so people can choose to. And like, there wasn't any, the, the thinking that should have gone into that and say, no, 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 no. We should have a long-term support versions that never happened or it probably did happen, but it did not happen in public and people didn't have a chance to come contribute to the conversation, right? So what happened now with the fork? It was blatantly obvious a year ago. Everyone who thought about it could see that there, there will be a fork. And the way that we're, we handle this fork and the way we handle this moving forward will set the tone for how WordPress works in the future. The worst thing that could happen is we go to WordCamp US in December this year, and there will be like a booth <laughs> or a bunch of people with classic press t-shirts on that will come and ha have been put into a position of opposition by the community and then will have to cause a stir. They'll, they'll like be incentivized through the dynamics of the community to start a fight, right? And then you'll get this stronger and stronger polarization in the community and it'll all be pointless it'll all be this unhealthy debate and i'm saying this because this is exactly what happens in grassroots political organizations without clear leadership structures this is why i keep saying to anyone who will listen wordpress is and has for a long time been a political organization in everything but name like we behave exactly like a grassroots political organization we do make all the same mistakes grassroots political organizations do the only difference is every decision we make impacts millions of people no tens of millions of people around the world it impacts how the web evolves because we have such a huge footprint yet we're behaving like a grassroots political organization with like 40 members right so there's this we need to have this complex conversation about how these decisions are made and how we move this forward in a responsible way without automatically writing off any dissenters. 
like saying, like, oh, you don't like Gutenberg? Well, it's because you're not, blah, 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 right? We need to have a conversation of why do you not like Gutenberg? Oh, is it because it'll end up costing you a ton of money or it'll make a lot of work for you or whatever? Okay, how do we remedy that situation in a way that doesn't stop development? How do we get where we want to go collectively without having to break the thing apart into two hostile groups that fight each other all the time. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, grassroots uh, kind of infighting and in typical grassroots fi, uh, style, there's even a change.org petition uh, to, <laughs> to try to stop Gutenberg, which is so, so grassrootsy. Uh, and, you know, the, the argument that um, Scott is making, and I'm, I'm actually hoping to kind of talk to Scott Bowler about it next week, uh, is um, fr from the page, we believe that feedback from WordPress users currently falls on deaf ears, mm -hmm. uh, and it is our mission to give them their voice back through a community-led fork. Uh, do you think the community's feedback is falling on deaf ears? Do you think do you think it's being listened to, but just overridden for some reason? I know for a fact feedback is being listened to, in that people are reading it. Uh, I know, I know a lot of the core developers of the Gutenberg project very well. They are great people. They have all the best intentions. They do amazing work and everything. Um, however, they've also been given a very, very, very specific mandate from the top. And the top has a name and it's one person and his name is Matt, that this is happening. There has There's a decision that's been made that this is happening, the end. So any anyone who says otherwise needs to get on board with this plan. Um, and if they don't like it, there's the classic editor plugin, the end. That's the conversation, right? So what you, ha what you have to understand when you look at how feedback is collected and what's done with it is there is a very concrete plan to do a very specific thing. And that plan is not going to change. Um, the question is, how was that plan? Like, who made that decision? How did the plan came about? How did how was how were people able to get involved in it? And I, I understand from a personal perspective and also from a political and open source perspective why people feel like this is just something that's being rammed down their throats because it kind of is, and that comes from WordPress going from a community of like. A, you know, a couple of 20s or hundreds of people developing software together to a community of millions and millions and millions of users. Um, and the distance between the people who develop WordPress and the people who use WordPress has become so big that you can honestly say the people who build WordPress, the people who are in the WordPress community and talk about WordPress are not the WordPress user. We're not representative of the people we build the thing for and therefore our opinions about what the user needs are not well informed because we don't have the data. And I've been talking about this for years, how we don't actually know anything about the end user of WordPress because we never, we don't have any data. We don't do proper research. We don't collect any data. We don't talk to them. We pretend as if the people who have, who use WordPress are the ones that show up at WordCamp, but that's not the case. Um, and changing that mentality, changing the mentality from I built this thing for me and other people can use it too, to I'm actually building this for other people that I don't know that I need to understand better is going to take years and it's going to take a full shift in the entire community. So the Gutenberg team does a ton of research and does a ton of work and listen to a lot of the feedback and try their best to meet the demands of what that feedback is. At the same time, they see a lot of the feedback that's coming in or is coming from old timers like me um, or people who've been around like for a long time like me who just say, you know, I don't like this thing and you're stupid. And you get this very difficult conversation of like, are you actually in disagreement on what we're doing or are you just being difficult because you want to be? Or is this, you know, do you have an, do you have an opposition to the cause of the thing or the thing itself. I mean, if you look at the conversation, you'll see there's a lot of people who keep saying Gutenberg is uh, some sort of almost conspiracy to add features to WordPress.com to improve WordPress.com's market position in um, uh, in relation to like Wix and Squarespace and all these things, right? And there's this, every, every time Matt shows up at anything, people will ask him like, Wah! and then they go like, when is automatic going to be bought by Google? And it just keeps, 
you can see there's this entire crazy thing happening there. And, you know, here's like old Morton coming in and yelling for people to get off the lawn and stuff. That's actually not what's happening at all. If you've been looking at WordPress.com for a long time, you know that WordPress.com like walked off into the sunset for a long time ago and did something completely different from WordPress itself. I mean, they've had Calypso for years and Calypso is fundamentally different from how WordPress works to the point where you don't recognize it as WordPress at all when you when you see it on wordpress.com so the notion that gutenberg is is some sort of conspiracy from automatic to gain market position is incorrect and like i said the idea of gutenberg came about in 2013 before these competitors existed so it's that's not what's happening here however because of how it's being communicated because of this um opaque a very foggy, weird leadership structure where everyone says, oh, there is no leadership team, but there's obviously leadership team and automatic pace for like 90% of the core developers of Gutenberg and everything is poorly communicated and no one is really accepting, no one is stepping up and saying, I'm taking charge. And then Matt says he's taking charge, but Matt is the lead, is the head of this huge company that has a vested interest in it. It's also the only company that gets to use the word WordPress in their marketing. There's, there's a lot of these very complex political dynamics in here that are not handled properly. And they're causing great animosity inside the community. And the lack of addressing that animosity then just conflates the situation more to the point where people send in pull requests to Gutenberg that are like, delete everything, right? And then they go, what? You stop my pull request. You're not listening to my feedback, right? And it's like, that is not what's happening, but we can't have these conversations because of this hyperpolarization. I mean, I posted a thing, um, I posted a ticket on Gutenberg or an issue on the Gutenberg GitHub repo uh, sometime last year, I think, or early this year that said, um, we need to have a clear, like we need to have someone create like, a clear document that just says, what is Gutenberg right now? Where is it going? What's going to happen? How are these decisions made? Just basically spell it out. That thread the conversation in that thing got so toxic they had to close it. And it, by that time, it was like hundreds of responses. It was unreadable because everyone was like, yeah, no, you're right. And it, just, it started with a very good conversation and then it just devolved into madness, which is what happens on the web all the time. But you can see how people come in with assumptions. They don't get information they need. Then they attribute the lack of information to some sort of conspiracy. Then they meet other people who think that this is happening, and then they start talking to each other, and then you get this very, very, very dangerous situation where people spin each other up, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And then no one is stepping in and saying, stop, here is the absolute transparent picture of what is happening. We're going to give you all the information you're looking for. And instead, you get these very vague political answers. And unfortunately, Matt is an excellent generator of very political uninformative inf answers that don't take the conversation forward. They don't, it's not harming, it's just not taking the conversation forward, which just adds to this, there's something happening behind the scenes I don't know about, and then everything just falls apart. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, I've been involved with several hacker spaces and just different communities that, uh, that did or didn't have leadership structures. Some of them were group consensus and some of them were, you know, a person owned the building and they got to make the calls and people could be, you know, with it or, or with it against it. Uh, but the one thing I've noticed uh, with very few exceptions is the ones that don't have a single leader or like, uh, you know, uh, two leaders usually are the ones that don't make it in the long term. Uh, I, I know that we have kind of a, a muddy structure, uh, you know, it's community led, but it's, it's not, uh, at the same time, but you know, it seems that for, for WordPress to be relevant for a long time, you have to have that, that spearhead, that one person making the decisions. Uh, it, it is weird in some ways that you know, M Matt will step back at times. He is the the, the lead dev on 5.0. Uh, so, you know, it makes sense that he gets to make the calls for that. I, I actually think it's good that Matt is, you know, that there is a person defining the future of WordPress. Uh, but, 
yeah, it is. It is weird that it feels that sometimes it, to, to me and maybe to some others, it feels that at times it is supposed to be this anarchic organization that kind of collectively makes decisions. And that at other times it feels like, no, that's, this is still Matt's project. There is no organization in the world that doesn't have a leader. <laughs> <laughs> or no, that's not true. There's no functional organization in the world that doesn't have a leader. You have to have a leader. That's the whole thing. Without a single person who's able to mediate conflict and say, no, we are doing this thing, not the other thing. You get nowhere, right? If you had six chefs in a, in a kitchen and no one was in charge, you would not get any food out because everyone would try to run the ship. So that's fine. We need leadership and, you know, for all my conflicts with Matt, he is the reason why WordPress is 31% of the web right now. He's the reason why he, why WordPress has become a proof of concept for proper open source software that is actually free and actually available to everyone. He is the reason why the idea of democratizing publishing is actually something we can believe in today. And I mean, WordPress has changed the world in a very real sense, thanks to Matt Mullenweg and a bunch of people who contributed to it. But without Matt Mullenweg, there would not be WordPress and there would not be the web we know today. So that that's a given. The problem isn't that we have a leader. The problem is we have no leadership structure below the leader. So there is no system in place for anyone to understand how decisions are being made. It means that decisions are made by a cabal of people, but no one knows who those people are. No one knows where those decisions are made. And in many cases, even the people who make those decisions don't realize they are making those decisions. I mean, I've been in chat rooms where decisions have been made, where I've been like, hey, 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 you just made a decision. You don't realize it, but you just made a very important decision here that no one has, like, it's not even acknowledged that that decision was made and the ramifications of this thing. And it's the, it is this dynamic of uh, open source software and, and um, meritocracy and all this stuff that like you, you write something that's good enough, it just gets baked in, but no one ever goes, well, is this actually what we want? Or maybe someone does, but they might have their own intents. I mean, there are features in WordPress that were added that should not be in WordPress because someone was like, hey, I can add this and no one's going to stop me. Um, so there, there, we need to have a larger conversation around how decisions are made in WordPress and how people are able to surface their opinions about where WordPress is going. Now, Matt has multiple times said that we're not going to have like a democratic rule here, which is perfectly fine. We shouldn't have. <laughs> WordPress can't be run by petition, right? And WordPress def absolutely cannot be run by some sort of absolute democracy where it's like every feature gets a vote and then every user gets a vote. However, what we do need is proper hierarchical leadership where we know who is in charge. We have influence over who is in charge and we can actually like bubble conversations up to the people who make decisions and have transparent conversations about what is happening, which is not happening now. We also need this kind of leadership structure because we need to have plans forward. Like if you like if you go to this Twitter conversation that's happening uh, around LTS right now, you will see that. Even the people who are currently building Gutenberg cannot answer the simple question, where does Gutenberg goes next? go next beyond uh, outside the editor. No one even knows what that means because it has not been defined. And the, the horrible part of that is when you go two years back and you talk to those same people, they didn't know where they were taking Gutenberg. A lot of Gutenberg has just dynamically developed itself into what it is today. I mean, when I talked to people last year before WordCamp US and I asked them a bunch of questions about how Gutenberg was gonna be developed, a lot of those questions had no answers. And in any other setting, that would be deeply concerning because it means that something is being developed without a clear idea of what is being developed. Like you're building something without knowing what you're building. And that's because there is no long-term plan. We, we don't have a thing that says in 2022, WordPress is going to X. It's going to have these types of features. A standard WordPress site will look like this or the WordPress user will be able to do that. Instead, we have in 2022, WordPress will be amazing. And nothing else. And because of that, 
I as a developer can't contribute to WordPress in a meaningful way because I want to contribute to things long term, right? Or I can contribute to current projects, but I can't do anything unless I go, hey, I want WordPress to have uh, some crazy feature and then I'll just build a feature plugin and try to like shoehorn it in, right? But then everyone does that. And then you get this weird dynamic where there is no ultimate goal. There's just a bunch of people throwing things in and we're always hoping that the things that get thrown in are the things we want. But at some point, someone's going to throw hemlock into it by accident and then just spoil the pot and kill everyone. So it's, it's, it's a very risky endeavor because we are not a small open source project. Like people keep talking about uh, Cafe Press and saying like, oh, you know, WordPress was a fork of Cafe Press. Well, Cafe Press had what? 200 users, 1,000 users, 10,000 users, I don't know. WordPress has millions and millions of users. So we can't treat it like it's this small dinky project. We have to treat it like it's this massive world changing thing, right? And this is what the Gutenberg team got right is that what Gutenberg does will impact every other web publishing application in the world. And you can see it already because uh, Drupal is trying to figure out how to put Gutenberg into Drupal. Not just that, but today, people from that Drupal Gutenberg project started poking at the GitHub repo, which is really interesting because all of a sudden you get developers from a completely different landscape come in and be like, hey, I have opinions about how this works because it'll impact my thing, right? So. Uh, this has a significant impact on how things work, but it also means the decisions that are made need to be very, very carefully made because they'll change the web as a whole, right? And a lot of the decisions that are made are the correct decisions. A lot of the decisions that are made are correct because people provided the right information or they kind of fell into it or it was the obvious thing to do. But some of the decisions that are made we don't know if they're the right decisions and we won't know for years. And by the time we realize that maybe some of them weren't the right decision, it'll be way too late. And those issues could have been resolved had we had plans so that we could say like, when we add this thing, what we're trying to do is actually this other thing that happens down the pipe. But we don't know that because we're not talking about that because we don't have leadership because no one wants to say, this is where we're going. That means you have to do this thing now, even though you don't want to. And that's all it boils down to. No one wants to sit on top and say, this is what we're doing. I know you don't like it, but this is what we're doing because we want to get over here. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. My name is Morton Rand Hendrickson. It's a long, complicated name, but when you go on LinkedIn and you search for Morton, you'll probably find me. Uh, and you can, or you can like go to LinkedIn Learning and then back like to my account, and you can send me questions there. Um, if you want to talk to me in public, uh, you can also go on Twitter. I am at Morton. That's M O R, and then the number ten one zero because that's my name, Morton. Um, and I usually respond to people who are on Twitter all the time. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you.